I V M. A grown man, an established journalist, Rusi K. Karanjia. The editor of a Bombay-based tabloid called Blitz was summoned to Parliament in 1961 to be reprimanded like a schoolboy because our Parliament parents did not like something that he wrote again. Oof! Chalo, at least this time they didn't issue an arrest warrant. Let's look at the bright side in these otherwise dark times. Hello and welcome to the Longest Constitution. My name is Priya Mirza and this podcast is about the Constitution of India and how it shapes the terrain of our lives. We are looking at work and in each episode we get a little closer to understanding the vision of our constitution. Okay, our first story today is about a young man, a left-leaning ideologue, Romesh Thapar, who had unsurprisingly a left-leaning magazine called Crossroads and the year is 1950. India is a newly minted independent country with a shiny new constitution and bursting with the freshly granted guarantees under our fundamental rights along with the tumult chaos and ecstasy which accompanies such grand moments it seems that everyone is trying to break free including communist prisoners in the Madras province who go on strike in the Salem Central Jail And when these prisoners claim their right to be treated as political prisoners rather than criminals in a horrific incident in the state of Madras in 1950 jailers and policemen bolted the doors and gunned down killing around 20 and injuring around 200 odd prisoners Thapar's journal Crossroads lashed out on this brutality with articles critical of the new indian government and administration just as an aside the communists believed that the freedom from the british wasn't real freedom and these sort of colonial era brutalities of the indian state only prove their point so the nervous government of madras did the easiest thing to do crossroads was banned The Madras government banned the magazine under the Madras Maintenance of Public Order Act. So can police brutality be hushed up in the name of public order to restrict a journalist from reporting the truth? Thapar didn't think so and promptly filed a petition in court challenging the prohibition and using the constitutional rights granted to him. So gentle listeners, we are beginning yet another journey. the journey of free speech with the pressing question how free is it and on what grounds can the state clamp down on our right to expression and not just as journalists who write for a living but literally anybody so that's a mini history we are embarking on about litigation over freedom of speech a pressing issue in the age of the internet the private ownership of internet service providers and internet shutdowns and twitter accounts being blocked which takes us to article 19 which has six great broad rights for citizens that's about right people so unlike article 14 the right to equality and article 21 which is the right to life and liberty which extends to all persons article 19 is for citizens only it's special and it is under article 19 that we are granted not only the freedom of expression but also the right to profession and livelihood and a journalist a writer a filmmaker a dancer or a sex worker are in fact doing both to karanjia ne kya kiya karanjia wrote an article about jb kripalani in 1961 so jb kripalani member of parliament gandhi an activist think of poof that's a lot except that karanjia's article made fun of his name The Kripaluni impeachment was the name of the article. Hmm, but is humor taken well by those who it is directed at? No. Plus our legislators take themselves so seriously. And parliamentary privileges were broadened to penalize journalists who comment on the conduct of individual members and thereby run the risk of holding parliament in contempt. or canton as the french call it why not be fancy while you can so the flow of information and humor and satire is in fact kept going by journalists 
writers, poets, novelists, and even stand-up comedians. And expressing and publishing is part of that informational ecosystem, which takes us to those people who are in fact expressing themselves but aren't being heard. The Adivasis of this country. And one such tribe are the Dongria Cones of Niyamgiri, listed as particularly vulnerable by the central government. They are a pre-agricultural group, hunters and gatherers, with a negative population growth, just about 8,000 of them, and live in the lush and green hills of Niyamgiri, where the Dongria cones grow oranges, pineapples, jackfruits. I love ripe jackfruit. And collect honey in this self-contained serene ecosystem alongside rivers and waterfalls, streams and dense forests where tigers, leopards, giant squirrels and sloth bears roam. Wow, sounds like paradise but is also rich in bauxite, the raw material for alumina and aluminium. And Orissa has 700 million tons of known bauxite reserves, of which 88 million tons are estimated to be found in the Niamgiri Hills. So nobody cared about this backward region in a backward state which was inaccessible for decades. I mean, these guys didn't have a bus service till 2015. But... In 2004, there were scores of trucks and people and machines. When Vedanta, a mining company based in London and owned by an Indian billionaire Anil Agarwal, began mining operations in Niamgiri. Now, we remember the Samtha judgment of 1997, don't we? The landmark judgment which said that the wealth of the tribal lands belonged to the tribals and restricted non-tribals from mining in scheduled tribe notified areas. But Vedanta and the government of India had no time for Samta. Vedanta built a refinery in the town of Lanjigarh and started to work on the conveyor belt that would bring the bauxite straight down from the hills to the refinery. And no surprise, the government approved and watched as Vedanta annexed over 60 hectares of forest land violating environmental norms, destroying the Kinari village, displacing these Adivasis to little concrete box-like houses at the foot of the hills with no running water and circled with barbed wire. So what happens when a private multinational corporation with billions has its eyes on the collective rights of a tiny group of secluded, isolated and self-sufficient people who are mostly illiterate and unfamiliar with modern bureaucracy? Meanwhile, what happened to our commie friend? In Ramesh Thapar vs. State of Madras 1950, the newly constituted Supreme Court upheld his challenge and struck down the Madras Maintenance of Public Order Act 1949, claiming that it violated the fundamental right of freedom and expression guaranteed by Article 19, Part 1 of the Constitution. And what happened to Rusi Karanjia? The matter was settled by a Delhi correspondent who apologised on behalf of Karanjia. But it also raised the question about the freedom of the press as well as the rights of the press. And of course, in case you haven't noted, by the way, the key difference between this case and the previous ones we've done is that those were related to state legislative assemblies. But this is Parliament Man and that is serious. So today's takeaways. The first, Romesh Thapar was the first constitutional free speech challenge and its success made it a constitutional landmark. The second, that legal disputes over land and forests involve making legal claims, one in which the litigants aren't always equally placed, like the one between Vedanta and the Dongria Cones of Niamgari. And this is just the beginning of the story. And finally, the freedom of the press has been an ongoing negotiation between the state and the individual, journalists and the judiciary. I hope you like the show. If you have questions or comments, please send them in on Twitter where I tweet at Fundamentally P or on Instagram, The Longest Constitution. Until next Wednesday, this is me, Priya Mirza, signing out.
There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Hello, everybody. It's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On the Habit Coach Communication Consultant, Cass Thomas tells Ashton why communication always needs to start with us. Misconduct is back with Season 3. Raghvi and Nisha tell us the real-life story of Gangubai Kathiawadi. On Audio Gyan, Kedar asks architect Fernando Velo about the future of maps in the digital era. On Naan Kari, Sadaf and Archib break down the history of India's most important ingredient, milk. And on Marathi Kirkitun, the Deshmukhs talk about Ravi Kiran Mandal and his contribution towards Marathi poetry. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, we've been doing a series of profiles of people within the office, so do check that out for sure. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any platforms you're listening on. And you can also check us out on YouTube. We have a page on our website, ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube, with a list of all our channels. We're also doing a small listener survey to better understand how you, the listener, responds to the advertising on our network. And also, we just want to know a little bit more about you. We would really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes to fill it out. It will really help us build some better shows for you. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors on the network this week, SBI Life Insurance and Jupiter, a digital banking app. 